Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. So today on the show, we're going to talk about ENTP careers. Hmm. Antonia, you identify as an ENTP. I do. Can you can you people even be helped with your careers? No. Nope. Is it even possible to have an ENTP that can be career-minded? Lost causes, all of us. Everyone. <laughs> clearly, clearly, I'm kidding, but... You know, I think ENTPs do struggle with careers in a lot of ways. I don't think it's a, uh, it's not a straight, clear cut path for the ENTP personality type. Well, there are some, some styles of ENTPs that do better than others, but I think every, every person with ENTP preferences have found it, it's been a winding road. Yeah to what it is that they ultimately end up doing. Although that, I mean, I could be totally wrong. I'm sure there's some ENTP that's listening or watching this that's going like, nope, I knew what I wanted to do when I was young. I went to college for that thing. I've been doing that thing for the last 30 years and it's all been awesome. But yeah. I think that's very much like the, I met my I met my uh, childhood sweetheart. In high school. In hi- Yeah, exactly. Or in like elementary school and we've been together ever since and we're yeah. now in our 60s. It's about as rare a story as that. Yeah. Well, this actually, the idea of careers came about right now. It's timely. I think a lot of people in general are looking at their career choice and their career path. And they're asking the question, is this really what I want to do? And we're actually in the middle right now, Antonia, of leading our personality life path mentorship program. So this is an eight-week program where we take students. It's a high level. It's one of the deepest programs we do. We walk students through every week, one of the Jungian cognitive functions, so the perceiving and the judging functions that we use in personality. And we look at the archetypical energy of that function each week. Like we take a new function each week and we give exercises to students to go test it in their life and their relationship with it, all with the purpose of discovering their pathway forward. So like if the personality type ENTP is the you are here dot on the map, this personality life path program talks about the terrain that is the map. Where are you heading now that you know who you are. In the midst of this program, people are obviously in transition. People who have joined this program are reevaluating their personal growth journey, their life journey, maybe their relationship. And man, a lot of people are coming to the table saying, I want to reevaluate my career and my career choices. So we're doing some coaching with people at a deep level, some ENTPs as well, on how to calibrate the career trajectory going forward. And one of the things that we use to help people identify the career path is something called subtypes. We've, we, through the work of, we'll explain this in a moment, but through the work of Dr. Dario Nardi and Helen Fisher and some other people, we've identified that not all ENTPs are going to be the same. They're not going to express the same. So we want to talk today through this lens, and maybe you can speak to that a little bit, Antonia. How can understanding the type of ENTP you are, the flavor of ENTP that you are, how can that help influence your career trajectory? Hmm. Well, I think what's so interesting about the work that Dario's done, and uh, if you want to understand more about how subtypes work, we recorded an entire podcast with Dario when he right. came and stayed with us. And he discussed what that means. What are four different subtypes? Uh, where does that come from? What is the information based on? And just as a really quick cliff notes, it it was something that emerged while he was observing people of the same personality type uh, through EEG scans that they had slightly different mind wiring, even if they were clustered in the same type. And so a pattern started to emerge that there were four different styles of wiring that were associated with these different types. And there was a pattern to that, meaning that there are four different subtypes that you're going to see in every single type. And so that alters or that kind of explains why not every ENTP looks like every other ENTP. And in fact, it's always been my pet peeve when people run around and tell you you're not the type that you identify with because you don't you don't show up in this like and then they'll like explain this very, very narrow set of character traits that are not common to every ENTP. They're just common to a certain kind or style. Yeah. And once I read the subtype descriptions, I went, oh, that person has this subtype of ENTP as their prototype in their mind, and they're completely missing the 75% of other, or at least the three other subtypes of ENTPs. Yeah. That happens over and over and over. And, and it happens for all types, by the way. It's very common for people to accuse each other of not being the, their best fit type. Sometimes they're accurate. Sometimes that person isn't that best fit type. But more often than not... 
It's yeah. just that they're a subtype that that individual is unaware of even existing. So the point of all of that is these subtypes are very influential in a lot of different, not just how we show up, not just our character traits, but the decisions we make, the kinds of things that are in alignment with us, including our career choices. Yeah. And uh, I think it's also really important to understand this this piece this under the this sort of burgeoning awareness of how type works particularly with um, brain scan technology because there's also a component that this is more of a nurture com uh, sort of a, a, a nurture uh, influence on type rather than just nature and what I mean by that is that there's some information that indicates that type is inborn. We're, we come pre-wired with certain preferences. And they've just about nailed this down with introversion and extroversion. But the other preferences, you know, it's hard to measure these things. But it does seem to be that we, we show up with this, you know, this way of looking at the world. But how we're going to manifest these into character traits, not to our mind wiring, not to the thing that's intrinsic to us, but the traits that we bring to the world, that's way more nurture oriented. That's way more about our experiences and our environment and how we've had to show up and respond to our environment and survival and, and all yeah. of that. And so the subtypes are more oriented towards nurture, which means that the subtypes can change. Your type doesn't seem to change. There's a lot of influence that indicates that if you're born with ENFP preferences like you are, Joel, you're going to stay in ENFP. If I'm born with ENTP preferences, I'm going to stay in ENTP. But the subtype of ENTP I am, that flexes and flows through my life depending upon my circumstances. So when we talk about type and careers, we're not just talking about career choices that would be good for our personality type and our subtype. We're also talking about a choice that's going to mold how my subtype looks yeah. because we spend so much time in our careers, you know, 40 plus hours a week that that is a, that's an environment we put ourselves in that we have to respond and react to. We have to solve certain problems. We have to engage and interact with certain kinds of hierarchies. And so it's a choice we're making, not just to match who we are now, but it's a choice we're making of what kind of person we want to be molded into in the future with yeah. this career choice. So I think it's really important. I think it's very important if you're an ENTP listening, I think you're going to get a lot of clarity on maybe the subtype that you identify with. Before we go down that rabbit hole, though, into the deeper stuff, I did my internet research, Antonia. According to the internet, uh, here are the top 10 list for ENTPs as far as career choices. You ready? Now, you're mm -hmm. an ENTP. You tell me if these resonate. Okay. Tell me how many of these you would do or you'd be like, what? <laughs> or how many I have done. <laughs> or, yeah. Or how many you have done. And the other thing is too, I think, uh, y you know, you're using a cognitive function, a dominant cognitive function of extroverted intuition, exploration, we call it. It has a lot of interest in a lot of different subjects. Indeed. So it could be all over the map. Here's the top 10 list. According, This is just internet research quickly just to get a sense. Number one, entrepreneur. So for ENTPs and their careers, here's the top 10 list on the internet. Number one, entrepreneur. Number two, lawyer. Three, marketing manager. Number four, salesperson. Five, consultant. Six, public relations specialist. Seven, real estate agent or broker. Eight, journalist. That's your favorite one, Antonia. Number nine, architect. And number 10, engineer. This is what the... I mean, this is a general list, right? It's not comprehensive or peer-reviewed yeah. or anything. Yeah. Well, some of those also require some specialized training to become... But of that list, I would say that I have either done that or worked in an office where that was the thing that was being done. I would say probably seven out of 10 of those. Wow. Like yeah. the lawyer, you worked mm -hmm. in a law office, but you weren't mm -hmm. a lawyer yourself yep. as an example. Yeah. All right. So as you look at that list and you're listening along right now, does that, do those identify with you? Do you, do those, they, maybe you're doing one of those, but maybe you're not doing one of those quote unquote top 10 best careers for ENTPs. I think it's hard to make a list like that that fits all ENTPs. So we go into this idea of subtypes now. Mm -hmm. There's four subtypes. Right. Dominant, creative, normalizing, and harmonizing. They're connected to Dr. Dario Nardi's work. Basically, he brought ENTPs into his lab. He connected EEG machines to their brain. He'd ask them a series of questions, and he'd watch the pattern of the brain, like, uh, brain scans, like how the scans would look. He would notice patterns, and he started to see a grouping of four subtypes of ENTPs. And... Then he also wove in some of Dr. Helen Fisher's work to notice that neurotransmitters mapped to these as well. So there's a pattern to this chemically in our brains as well, like testosterone, dopamine, 
serotonin and estrogen Mm -hmm. also help us identify which one we might lean more toward. So that's the basics. Let's walk down into these now and let's talk about each one of these in specificity. So you as an ENTP listening along, as you listen to this, you might understand, oh, well, no wonder I have an aptitude for that career. No wonder I'm not interested in that career that the internet says I should be interested in. Mm-hmm. I'm this style of ENTP. Yeah. And the other final thing to say is, just like Antonia said at the beginning, this isn't a type. These aren't types of ENTPs. You are an ENTP, an ENTP, an ENTP. Like that's how you identify. That's how your cognition is wired. This is how you express that. So it can change. Your career can influence it. And you can influence which career you go toward. So not only will the type of subtype you are influence the career you choose as an ENTP, but the style of career you choose will also influence which style of ENTP you are as well. Yeah, exactly. And the there's a couple of things I want to add. First, if the phrase or the subtypes dominant, creative, normalizing, and harmonizing sound familiar... Uh, Dario borrowed these terms from Dr. Victor Galenko, who's done a lot of um, research in socionics, which Mm -hmm. is a almost like sort of the the Russian version of Mm Myers-Briggs. And he borrowed those terms um, with permission from Victor. And the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, up until the age, it seems up until the age of 25 years old, the most influential thing or uh, facet on our type or how our type shows up is gender. After 25, it's career choice. And so if you are 25 years old or older, um, then we really, like it, it's it's very influential. The career you go into, or maybe even the series of careers you go into, because we are talking about people with ENTP preferences. Yeah. So the reason why I said, yeah, I've done at least like seven out of 10 of those, or at least been working in an environment that that was the focus. I don't think it's uncommon for people with ENTP preferences to, to job hop a lot, yeah. right? To go from job to job to job. And that's one of the big challenges. It's one of the reasons why they're like, okay, what is the career I should finally land in? Because if you keep job hopping, yeah. now your resume might have a lot of variety on it, but it's hard to express expertise. It's hard to say, I'm really good at this one thing. And having a wide variety of jobs, I would think that would be a good thing, but it actually usually isn't. Uh, it looks like you're unpredictable. It looks like you don't really have a focus. And so being able to narrow it down and not just go from career to career to career. I mean, a career is something you've chosen. Jobs are things that you're just doing. A career is a path. Hmm. So what career, what path should I be choosing can be a little stressful for people with ENCP preferences because just the idea of nailing something down and just choosing one thing all by itself can be something that feels binding. Well, and I would also argue that ENTPs, they will attempt a career or a job that maybe they're unqualified for, but it's very difficult for an ENTP to go towards something they don't feel competent around. Mm-hmm. Like it, they want to feel competent when they do something. So sometimes it can hold back an ENTP that wants to do something if they feel like they're going to be silly or look dumb or they don't have enough information or training or specialization in that. That can alter the type of career they choose. Well, on the on the flip side, I think that they can also, I mean, some ENTPs can talk themselves into jobs that they're wildly no. unqualified for. No, don't say that's and, true. And just assume that they'll figure it out as they go. And it's not uncommon for <laughs> somebody with ENTP preferences to actually succeed in doing that. Yeah. Only to find that once the thrill of having figured everything out, right? All the things that they were like stressing out to learn because they talked themselves into this thing. That six month mark. Hits. At the six month mark, they're like, oh, this is boring too. Yeah. Oh, shoot. <laughs> uh, so it's there. Sometimes there's the thrill of the kill yeah. of getting a job that you're like, I want to see if I can just get it. And you do. And you're like, oh, I, now I have to hustle and figure all these things out. And that was providing a bunch of like interesting adrenaline. Yeah. But once that's complete, you're like, oh, this is just like every other job. Yeah. Right. It's just uh, now, once I figure it out now, it's set it and forget it. And I don't want that. I want something that's constantly challenging. So another part of the career path is finding something that will suit an ENTP's desire to be constantly challenged. Keep learning. Yeah. Keep right. growing. Let's get into these subtypes. So let's talk about the first one, dominant. What are the characteristics of the dominant subtype for ENTPs? Okay, so dominant ENTPs are going to be a far more assertive version. Uh, both of their functions. Oh, and I was gonna, I was gonna let you know as a listener, you who doesn't have a mic, uh, I'm, I'm gonna do my best to make sure that these are very accessible if you're just learning type. So I want to make sure that this is simple enough so that if you are brand new to type, you can understand what we're talking about. 
but I'll also be putting some stuff in for the type geek. So I'll, I'll give you a word of warning. And right now, the word of warning is that uh, I will talk a little bit about the cognitive functions of mm -hmm. ENTPs. Yeah. So both of those functions of extroverted intuition or what we call exploration and introverted thinking or accuracy, they both have a very analytic bent. They both have an assertive energy and they're very focused. This makes uh, the dominant ENTP one of the most confident yeah. Um, they're, they don't question themselves a lot. And that brings a lot of good stuff. Dario describes them as being in uh, confident, independent experts. They enjoy a lot of variety. They're lifelong learners. This is very com common for all ENTPs. Um, they are, uh, particularly insightful problem solvers, particularly when they grab, um, solid frameworks, cheerful, sophisticated in charge of their lives. That's the dominant part and uh, serious when they get into work. Yeah. So they take work very seriously. And that's a part of the component of being a dominant ENTP. Of course, they're out of the box thinking uh, thinkers. They connect stuff in unusual ways. That's very common for all ENTPs. Um, but I think what really, what really helps them is that they are good at making things happen and are more professional. There's like a professionalism to a dominant ENTP. Again, they're serious about work and they have a more in-charge style. So they're more likely to be managers. Uh, they're more likely to be in a leadership position hmm. than other ENTP types. They are, um, uh, it's hard to really communicate the specific careers this style of ENTP will be good at because they're they're jack of all trades. They're kind of good at whatever they set their mind to. So it's more about interest than it is specific career path or excuse me, field. Yeah. But there are some careers that are better than others. So I'll name some of those. But whether it's business, education, the social sciences, all of it will appeal. Now, I think what's really important is that what narrows some of this down is that uh, the dominant ENTP is fascinated by human problems. Hmm. And so as long as they're problem solving and there's a human component to it, like a people problem component, then it's going to be even more interesting. So it's not just like an analyst in the background. It's not somebody who's just trying to solve any problem. There's going to be, of course, a, a component in there that's uh, inventiveness is in interesting. And they might actually be a literal inventor, but... The problem solving component lights up way more if there's a human aspect to it and not just a digital aspect. Yeah, I almost imagine less the creative like inventor type, but more the entrepreneur type that yeah. wants to start a business, get it growing, serve people, tapping into the customers. Like this is the the leadership styled ENTP. Yep. Is yeah. The, is the dominant. Yep. Exactly. Um, they're really good at assisting other people's structures and processes, but they don't themselves like to have to build structures and processes, and so they want a more free form style, even though they would like to have a lot more. Um, uh, there's a desire for high scaled influence without necessarily having to build the structure underneath in order to yeah. support it. So they're usually supportive of other people's structures, but they still want to be in a more dominant position there. So that kind of narrows some of the options, you yeah. know? Oh, yeah. And entrepreneur would be one of them. When you're at the beginning of something, you don't necessarily have to have this like really buttoned down structure, but you're still the most influential person in making all the decisions. And that's a sweet spot. So it's not uncommon for dominant ENTPs to start their own businesses for that very reason. But some of the other possibilities are things like executive coach, right? Yeah. You're coaching somebody who's at the top, at like maybe a C-level coach, um, a social scientist, uh, training and development specialist, a professor or an educator of some sort, uh, a marketing strategist. These would all be right up a dominant ENTP's alley. Okay. And the neurotransmitter this is associated with is testosterone. Mm -hmm. That would be its preference. Like this style would probably prefer that over some of the other chemicals. Let's talk about the creative subtype. What is the creative subtype of ENTP look like? Okay, so a creative subtype is going to be a lot less serious about their career. In fact, that's gonna be one of the bigger struggles. I wouldn't be surprised that when people think of ENTPs as being a bit flighty uh, you know, in careers, they're usually talking about the creative ENTP because they have a harder time nailing things down. Yeah. Dominant ENTPs don't need a lot of grounding practices, they're usually you know, they, they, even if they don't like structure themselves, they can at least discipline themselves to, you know, to show up. 
Uh, creative ENTPs usually need some sort of grounding exercise. They need something that reminds them to sort of be here and remember their appointments and go do the things that they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And um, another grounding hobby could be something like even horticulture, but something that reminds them to, to stay on earth. They're a little bit more of the heads in the clouds style of ENTP. Um, they are very exciting though. <laughs> There's a lot of different ventures that they like. They're the ones who... Uh, aren't a jack of all trades in a um, like a serial way. Yeah. They're a jack of all trades in a simultaneous way. They've got their fingers on a lot of pies usually at the same time. And so they are very interesting. They're very interested. They take in and, and play with a lot of data and information. They usually know a ton of stuff about, yeah. you know, disparate things. They are super focused on possibilities. And they have a tendency to stir the pot and get things going. So unlike the dominant style, which is more of an in-charge style, this is more of a get things going style. Th this is what I think of as the classic stereotype of the Doc Brown from Back to the Future yeah. or even Rick Sanchez from Rick and Morty. Mm -hmm. Kind of like this bombastic, devil may care, just attitude of like, it'll we'll figure it out as we go. Mm -hmm. Let's just keep causing chaos around ourselves and have fun. That's yeah. basically their metric. Yeah, exactly. And they are probably the strongest of uh, brainstormer of the four subtypes. Yeah. Now, extroverted intuition, that cognitive function, for those of you who like uh, are a little more geeky, that cognitive function is the brainstorming function. So these would be the most brainstorming of all the brainstormers. All right? yeah. So they come up with quick, creative ideas very, very fast. And that's, that is the thing that they do better than anybody else. But they have a weak, what's called a halo pattern, which is when the um, sort of there's a halo pattern that comes up on EEG machines when a person is good at practical support skills and practical social skills, and they have the weakest of the four. Hmm. So they're the best brainstormers, but the hardest one at being practical, Yeah, which is unsurprising. Um, they're hard to miss. They also gravitate towards things like entrepreneurship. Um, but they're also very good at promoting. They're good at talking to people. They're good at exploring possibilities, making deals. Um, they are the ones who have a tendency to jump around to multiple businesses, which is unsurprising. Um, and usually when they bring their talents in, it's a mix of a little bit of business, a little bit of psychology, a little bit of maybe, you know, specialist training, maybe legal training or something to that effect. But it's, it's a, they're looking for possibilities that merge all these different skills they've picked up going from thing to thing to thing. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the geeky part, though. How are their functions attuned? Oh, so uh, if you're... I, I do actually have a list of specific careers, though. Do you oh, yeah, to let's say do this? the okay. careers. Let's do that first, then okay. we'll go to the geeky stuff. Yeah, and then I'll do the geeky. Okay, so um, I wrote out a list of things that I think probably would very much uh, suit um, a, a creative ENTP. Um, these are the ones who you're probably going to see become comedians. Yeah. All right. The creative ENTP, because there's a disproportionately high number of ENTPs in the comedy world. And I have a suspicion that a lot of them are ENT, I mean, uh, creative subtypes. But copywriter, marketing specialist, specifically digital marketing specialist, um, like a YouTube host or a critic would be very common. Uh, something like um, uh, photography might even, like something more artistic, graphic design, film and video production. Uh, please, 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 nobody quote me or fight me on this one because it's not a hill I'll, I'll die on. But I've always suspected that maybe Quentin Tarantino might have ENTP preferences. Yeah. And I would suspect he's a creative ENTP. Same thing with Dave Chappelle. Mm -hmm. Again, I wouldn't fight over that. But yeah. If he's an ENTP, I would guess he'd be a creative one. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you've also got things like, you know, things like podcasting and anything where there's a platform already built in some other way and the ENTP just needs to show up and start talking to a microphone. Not that I'm a creative ENTP, but <laughs> these kinds of things where somebody else is kind of responsible for making sure that the rest of the things happen and then that ENTP just needs to do what they're good at. Yeah, and these are the ENTPs that challenge the rest of us when we're <laughs> like... <laughs> Like, not challenge us directly, but are challenging to help work <laughs> alongside because they're lone actors often. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're creative, you have the creativity and you, it's the interfacing with other people can maybe be a challenge because, again, you're being creative and you're moving really fast. Yeah. Well, Dario very kindly, when he talks about them, talks about how important grounding things are. I already yeah. mentioned horticulture, grounding exercises, music, martial arts, yoga. It's like a loving, caring family and a good institution might also help. It's like, get the help you need in order to, you know, not just be all over the place. Yeah. Uh, look for those tools. And then you asked, what's the geeky um, 
Oh uh, yeah, so tech for, stuff for yeah for type nerds that are following along, the analytic and holistic attunement of each of the two functions in the front. Right. Again, if you want to know more about analytic versus holistic, please go check out our subtype podcast with Dario. Yeah. But those of you who are caught up to speed and like the geeky part, um, the uh, perceiving function again in this case extroverted intuition or exploration that's going to have a, um, an analytic bent it's going to be that more assertive uh, quality to it but the judging function in this case introverted thinking or accuracy that's going to be a little bit more diffused that's going to be more what's called holistic and so that's one of the reasons why it's harder to make things happen because your judging function yeah. even if it is introverted is a little bit more open-ended and doesn't have as you know it, it's it's not as certain of all the things that it's trying to accomplish yeah and then as far as a neurotransmitter uh understanding goes this is going to be this is the subtype attuned to dopamine right so chasing dopamine mm -hmm. this is the one that would be uh very much in alignment with that so you can already see a chemical difference here as well Let's talk about the normalizing subtype of ENTPs. All right. These uh, these ENTPs. By the way, we mentioned this in some of the other career-based podcasts. Uh, a dominant ENT ENTP that we just mentioned before um, or mentioned a couple of subtypes before, that is an ENTP that might be mistyping themselves as an ENTJ. Yeah. Right? Or maybe even an ESTJ. Yeah. And the creative ENTP, they might be mistyping themselves as an ENFP. Right. Yeah. Um, or, or some other type like that. So the normalizing ENTP is a type that is relatively sedate in comparison to the others. Uh, they're not going to have as much trouble. I mean, in fact, they're going to have the exact opposite problem that a creative ENTP is going to have. They're way more grounded. They're way more conscientious and responsible, actually. Uh, they blend better in society. That's why they're called normalizing. They are comfortable with structure. They're comfortable with detail. They're, they tend to be a little bit more organized. Now, of course, we're talking relative to ENTPs, right? Yeah. They're not going to be as organized, structured as, say, an ISTJ. Yeah. But in comparison to their, you know, to other ENTPs, they're going to have a little bit more comfort with all of this. They're still curious mavericks, right, at heart. But they're, they're going to be a little bit more even keeled and they're, they'll be more um, comfortable with things like management than, say, a creative would. They have a more linear thinking style. They have a much stronger halo effect, mm -hmm. right? The, the creative had hardly any, but the normalizing has a much stronger halo of you know, practical um, skills and support skills. Yeah. Uh, they are more likely to observe before talking which is not usually what we think of as an ENTP trait. No, we do not. <laughs> no, we do not, Antonia. <laughs> but they're better listeners than maybe some of the other ENTPs. Um, they are also, uh, again, you can find them in almost any arena because ENTPs are interested in whatever bit them, whatever bug bit them. But whatever they go into, they're going to have that higher level of conscientiousness. So they might have a background in science, engineering, construction, finance, history, linguistics, operations management, um, any other area that that requires wide knowledge, technical details, and big picture understanding. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for something that marries those three things. And it's not uncommon for them to be specialists. Yeah. Right? Because they they are, when I said, you know, there's that ENCP that knew what they wanted to do in high school and has been doing it ever since. If there is such an ENCP that's listening, it may be a normalizing ENTP. Yeah, we've done uh, some corporate work with a company recently where I believe that the the person that was in the lead was an ENTP. And they're, I mean, it was a major corporation, like Fortune 100 company. And so I would assume you almost have to be comfortable with some of the, what I would consider the BS of the corporate world, the red tape, the regulation, the net, and they're in a very heavily regulated industry as well. But they were very creative. Mm -hmm. They came at problems with a creative bent and a big picture mindset and all the problem solving you'd expect from an ENTP, but they were able to play so nicely in that system mm -hmm. that my guess is they were probably a normalizing ENTP. Yeah. Yeah. Either normalizing or dominant, but I, either one I could see and, and definitely seem to have a patience for sticking with one thing for a very long time. So, so then we could say this is the ENTP that is probably the most comfortable inside of an organization, getting that mm -hmm. nine to five job, clocking in the 40 hours a week, taking the weekends off more of a traditional lifestyle. Whether they found themselves there or they chose that, this is that subtype that's okay with that 
existence. Yeah, a little more. They've they've learned the value of of using an institution or something outside of themselves to ground themselves. Uh, they usually stay organized with. Um, I don't want to use the word tricks, but like they've tricked themselves into being organized. They found some sort of system. They found some sort of like set of strategy. They they're not. This description is not to indicate that they're necessarily inherently good at being organized and doing all these things. It's that they figured out how to yeah. survive in a context like that and make it okay. And so the organization part is still something they have to figure out. Yeah. It's just they figured it out. That's as opposed to resisting it, like say the creative subtype. Um, but they still, they have no patience for rigidity. So they're still going to complain. If they're in a context that is the just the right amount of structure, they're going to be right or they're going to be fine. But if it's too much, then the the ones who are going to complain about rigidity, right? They're not going to be okay with that. Yeah. Um, but they're really good at juggling a ton of complexity and spotting weaknesses in the system. And so they are very valuable in any sort of corporate situation because they're the ones who have the patience to show up every day but still have the ENTP mind of solving problems listening before listening before talking which by the way no matter what kind of ENCP you are that is an incredibly important skill to learn listening before talking gathering all the information managing a ton of a ton of that data and then finding all the weaknesses and the leverage points in that system so any career that allows them to marry all of that is really important um some specifics are uh things like um business or financial analyst as there's a um uh a lot of attraction to things like that, being an analyst of some sort. Uh, project management is something that is specific to this type of ENTP. Dominant maybe also, but the other ENTPs kind of struggle with that. But this kind of normalizing ENTP might be pretty decent at project management. Yeah. Um, then there's still going to be, uh, if an ENTP has writing chops, it might be the normalizing ENTP that it has the patience for writing, yeah. both fiction writing, but also technical writing. They might be very good technical writers. And so um, some of the other careers we mentioned might appeal to a normalizing ENTP as well, but they're the ones that are going to have the patience for being an analyst more and a patience for writing. So again, if you're following along, you're more of a type geek or type nerd. Uh, serotonin is the neurotransmitter for this subtype. Antonia, what is the attunement of the two cognitive functions, the driver dominant and the auxiliary co-pilot? Analytic versus holistic, how are they framed? Okay, so for the type geeks, normalizing is the opposite of creative. So it's the judging function, in this case, introverted thinking or accuracy, that has the analytic or assertive bent. And it's the perceiving function of extroverted intuition or exploration that has the more open-framed yeah. holistic bent. Uh, you know, this might be a type that mis mistypes as an SFJ, potentially. Wow. Um, or an SJ type, right? Yeah. Uh, they might not identify with all the particularly the more sort of Doc Brownie creative ENTP subtype characteristics. So they might have a hard time identifying as an ENTP. But one of the ways that you know that they still are, have ENTP preferences is that if they allow themselves to get too into this style of life, and they don't have healthy creative outlets or healthy, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, something that ma uh, keeps their world bigger. Hobby. Right. They don't have a hobby or something yeah. that allows them to like do bigger things. And that could include a lot of travel, right? World travel or something that is highly social. If they don't have something occupying the creative part of their mind or their the intuitive part of their mind, they're going to fall into a bunch of unhealthy forms of escape. And so they will get um, indulgent if yeah. they don't have a, a way to sort of manage that piece because the sedate normalizing lifestyle yeah. uh, that they have figured out how to sort of operate in and thrive in is still not the natural form. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they have to have something that feeds this intuitive part of themselves. Otherwise, they'll get too indulgent. Yeah. What I hear you saying as a normalizing subtype if you're an ENTP and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm identifying with that, you probably have figured out one of two strategies. You either are indulging and maybe not behaving badly, but maybe behaving indulgently, or you figured out a hobby or something to express some of that creative, quirky, weird 
into be nature. Basically, what you're saying, Antonio, is that has to be expressed somehow. Unless you direct yeah. it and put attention to it, it's probably going to come out in maybe challenging or at the worst unhealthy ways yeah it's it's better to you know be in your 50s and meet up every friday for dungeons and dragons with a group of people and then go do cosplay conventions every three months or whatever it's better to do that than to find yourself playing video games until two o'clock in the at night every night and then waking up like exhausted because yeah. you know you know what i mean yeah. like you're just doing this thing that's like trying you're trying to get this hit yeah that's not really satisfying Yep. Um, it's much better to sort of pour yourself into the bigger, more satisfying version of that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a note. So let's talk about that final subtype, harmonizing ENTPs. What are the characteristics and jobs that this subtype would want to go toward? Okay, so harmonizing ENTPs are, uh, and, and we've mentioned this every time we've talked about this subtype, they are almost always an older version of an ENTP. Yeah. They have, um, they've mastered a few really important things and uh, kind of like the normalizing subtype, they have a bit of a more chill vibe uh, and they're, they're more support oriented. They're very supportive. So Dario describes them as supportive facilitators. Um, they're patient. They are um, energized by deep passion and broad principles so this is, they're not going to be the bouncing all over the place ENTP or the, the, the kind that's debating all the time and arguing all the time. This is going to be more that is, um, has a really strong theoretical bent. Um, they're really good at asking open-ended questions. In fact, they're far more likely to uh, debate with somebody through asking questions than, um, you know, like asserting opinions, if that makes sense. Yeah. So this is a very reflective version. In fact, in EEG scans, there's a back bias in, in these that indicates um, a particular form of reflection. And they, are, they, they tend to be um, much more about reaching out to people, guiding them, inspiring them. Uh, they are good at listening. They're like, um, just like the normalizing has gotten good at listening. The harmonizing has also developed a capacity for listening and observing, mm. but they're doing it from a sophisticated theoretical basis. They're not just listening for content. They're listening to match that information into broad theoretical frameworks, which is a major guide for how they do anything. Um, they are also... Uh, good at looking at things from multiple angles yeah. at multiple scales and then figuring out exactly what layer a person is talking about. So I'm just going to read Dario's example because I thought this was so good. He said, um, for example, when looking at economic issues, there's the large scale of national, global, and cross-cultural power dynamics. Then there's the mid-scale of finances and functioning of a specific industry or organization. And finally, there's smaller scale groups within those. So you're, whenever you're talking about a subject, uh, it's going to be the harmonizing ENTP that just instinctively knows, well, first of all, we've got to figure out what scale we're talking about because they're thinking about it in multiple scales simultaneously. And so they're good at listening and observing because they're trying to figure out what, where exactly on these scales is the other person talking about? Where ex what exactly in this um, multiple scenario structure is the person talking and they're good at listening to meet the person where they're at in that conversation. Yeah. Which uh, not all not all ENTPs have the capacity for that. Sometimes they just make assumptions and jump to, right? They just listen to a little bit of information and they assume they know what the person's talking about. This is this ENTP is more likely to wait and try to figure out exactly where the person is um, coming from because uh, it, it's not always it, it's not always obvious initially. So as you're talking and explaining this, the image I'm getting is, well, I mean, it basically sounds like you're describing a mature ENTP, not a certain subtype, but right. somebody that has <laughs> maturity and seasoning. Because I'm, I'm trying to imagine a 15-year-old that's wired this way as an ENTP. And right. I'm, it's hard for me to imagine a 15-year-old ENTP that has this finesse and this grace and all of this that you're talking about. But if I imagine ENTP at the age of 60, yeah, I could see that. So... Right. I guess it brings up the question, the the thought that some of these some of these subtypes are, they come about through the maturation process of life mm. as we grow and move. And I wonder if we could see a harmonizing again ENTP at the age of fifteen. 
Well, I will say this. The we usually talk about this at the end of the subtype, but the this subtype, the neural transmitter relationship they have is to estrogen. Yeah. So, um, just as a little note, the majority of people who identify as an ENTP are men. It's a it's a smaller percentage of ENTPs that identify as women. And so because of that, if somebody does have a preference for the harmonizing subtype and they're younger, right? They're not well seasoned into their 50s and 60s, but they're younger. It's probably more likely to be somebody um, who has a preference for estrogen. It's more likely to be a woman because she's been socialized that direction and because she just naturally has a preference for estrogen. So female ENTPs are more likely at a younger age to tap into the harmonizing um, sort of or be the harmonizing subtype. Yeah. And oftentimes what they need to do is they need to choose careers that encourage them to get into a more assertive place because they actually are ENTPs that don't know how to stick up for themselves as much. But an ENTP that is older that is harmonizing may have, especially if they are a man, they might have started out with a preference for testosterone or dopamine or serotonin. Like they may have been more assertive and then found themselves going to this direction as they got older. Yeah. In Jungian theory, for those of you who are geeks, this is a time period maybe they're, they've integrated their anima. But this might be something they found later in life. Yeah. Whereas a younger ENTP woman might have been socialized into this, but still have you know, like they, like she needs to kind of get more of that dominant energy going if possible, because that's the stick up for you, yourself side. Yeah. So there's a little bit of that in here too, I think. Do we go over the jobs that this subtype might choose? Not yet. So um, these are not dogmatic, loud or pushy ENTPs. So they're not that good at like necessarily doing hardcore marketing like some the other ENTPs, like a, a, a dominant or a creative ENTP might be much better at marketing. Um, they're probably going to be a lot better at sell, like promotional and selling styles of jobs. The CNCP is not going to be that great at those unless they teach themselves that. But they are going to be very, um, they're, they're going to be a lot better at uh, things that require a softer touch. All the same ENTP skills, but a little bit more of a softer touch. So things like human resource specialist, mm. um, consultant for management, Education and training. Anything in education and training is usually right up their alley. Public public policy analyst might be something that's up their up their alley. Market research analyst. So instead of doing the marketing and the promotion, they're analyzing marketing um, and promotional things. Counselor or therapist is very common for harmonizing subtypes. Uh, there were even things like meditation and mindfulness instructor, yeah. which I thought was interesting. Research psychologist, life coach, um, and uh, spiritual counselor was hmm. was on the list. A lot of those things that like lend themselves to your energy, Antonia. Yeah. Some of the career choices you've made. You're a coach. You help people. You want to tap into higher esoteric spiritual principles. Do you identify as the harmonizing? I do. I yeah. do. I, uh, I suspect that I have a harmonizing subtype preference, but I am trying to train myself out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to choose. A, I'm actually going more towards the creative subtype. Huh. I'm trying to get more of that analytic um, energy inside of me because I think I was trained into being a harmonizing ENTP and I'm missing some of the skills that are available to me in other subtypes. So that's a really key point that we can start to wrap up with. Uh, oh, by the way, the uh, the attunement, but before we move on to the point I want to make from that, the attunement of the functions. Yes. Both are holistic. They are. Yeah. They're the opposite of the dominant. Yeah. So if the dominant is both of them are analytic, assertive energy, and have a preference for the neurotransmitter of testosterone. This is the exact opposite. Both of the function um, preferences is for holistic. So it's a very open, framed, takes in a lot of information, but doesn't really focus on any one thing specifically. Yeah. And has that um, preference for t- uh, for estrogen. Yeah. Okay. So you said that you feel you were trained into that. Mm-hmm. Well, that, again, speaks to the fact that you're not one of these subtypes. Right. You're not an ENTP harmonizing ENTP like the expression of your ENTP nature maybe is harmonizing now but you can retrain yourself and it also so it might your subtype of how you naturally feel wired and all of these your your natural expression can help determine which career you choose but again the career you choose or the way you're trained or the way you're raised may shape you into one of these subtypes Mm -hmm. that maybe wasn't as natural to you Mm -hmm. so as you're evaluating your career path as an ENTP you're listening along and you're going okay what should I do with my life am I doing the right thing what you choose will start to shape how you express. Yep. I mean, that seems like it's 
basic 101 understanding as humans. And yet we choose stuff all the time that isn't in alignment with us and doesn't help wire us the way we want to be. Yeah. And so you, as you're doing the creative stuff, I'm guessing you're choosing activities and paths to put yourself on that will help wire that in more and more. And this is available to you. If you're listening along as an ENTP, you can actually choose things that will put you into one of these categories and help shape it. It can also help give you a sense of which career to choose in the first place. Yeah. And it's really important to understand the value or like, first of all, that not every ENTP is exactly the same. We know that, but these kinds of, this kind of information really illustrates it, right? In sort of harder lines. Um, But it's like, well, project manager project management might end up on a list of um, ENTP career options, but I would be a terrible, in fact, I know for a fact I'm a terrible project manager. I just know that. I'm a, I'm a harmonizing ENTP. Like I'm all about like, you know, delighting in others, learning and shifting and growing. I'm not like, okay, you go do this, you go do this, right? But if I want to become better at that, normalizing ENTPs are pretty good project managers. So I have it, if, I w- am I, if I'm willing to train myself to go do those things. Now, it, it doesn't feel as natural to me. And so it might require me putting myself in that position and going through the pain of learning how to do it and kind of failing a little bit and being like, this sucks, I don't want to do this. And, and then saying things like, this is not what ENTP is like. And it's like, no, this is what other ENTPs are okay with, not me though. But if I can get to the other side of that, now I've picked up some of, that, some of those chops from the normalizing side. Yeah. And now I have... A, a broader spectrum. So I think that's the other piece is it's like, well, if I want to pick something up that other ENTPs are doing, then I just have to get into their energy. I have to figure that out and it's available to me or I can go, you know what? I'm just not interested in that and that's okay too. Yeah. And I think from a principled level in our modern culture and world, we assume that I am who I am, which career fits me. Mm-hmm. That's what we ask, mm-hmm. but we don't ask I am who I am which career fits me and how do I want to change to fit it? In other words, there's two nodes in the system. It's not just which career tailors itself exactly to who I am exactly in this moment. Mm -hmm. It's what do I choose that will shape me as well and it can stretch me as well as I interface with that career. I think that's Mm -hmm. how I'm starting to see it in like a principled way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's like career ship. Yeah, it's like um, career ship and it's like the interoperability that I am with the careers that I'm engaged with. Mm -hmm. It's not like, and same thing with partners. It's in other words, you're not just triangulating, you're not just bringing somebody or something into your life and making it fit tailored to you. Mm -hmm. You also have to adjust yourself to make it fit tailored to you. Like you're also changing through the process, which is really important, I think. Anything else you want to say before we land the plane today uh, about ENTPs and the different subtypes and how they influence career? Um, No, I just think it's really important to, no matter what, remember that we're, everything that we're talking about is relative to ENTPs, Yeah. right? So when we talk about being more organized, we're saying organized relative to an ENTP. Yeah, as or, far as ENTPs go, organized. Ex- exactly, exactly. So don't get too <sighs> attached to those. Oh, by the way, I was going to say that um, the I, I, there was one more thing, that the harmonizing ENTP might mistype themselves as, say, an INFP yeah. or possibly an INFJ, um, something that's a little bit more feeling-oriented, but they're still ENTPs. And uh, just, um, just kind of know that it's all relative, this ENTP, the harmonizing ENTP is still going to be an ENTP in other ways. So um, so there are characteristics that follow regardless of the subtype. And I would guess too, well not guess, we know this based on people in our, our students and clients report this, this can be stratified. Mm-hmm. In other words, you could be more dominant at work, but more normalizing at home, mm-hmm. like with your partner. Like there's different, now it's going to lend itself to a certain style, but you can have a different style based on the context that you're in. You kind of want to, actually. Yeah. In some ways, I think that the most enviable, envious position or enviable position is somebody who has figured out how to navigate through all the subtypes. And now they have, you know, there's no money left on the table. Now they have a lot of flexibility in how they're showing up to each context. So you're an ENTP listening. We want to hear from you. You have been listening to Antonio and I describe these four subtypes, but you haven't had a microphone to talk back and let us know what's coming up for you. What's your career story? What is the story of your working life? Are you just starting out? Maybe you're out of university or you're ready to graduate soon. You're going to start on your career path. Maybe you've been in a career for a while and you're ready to either make a change or really focus in on the thing you're going to do going forward from here. Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. Share your experience with us, your story, Maybe some of the learning or advice that you've gotten through your career or some of the things you're looking toward. Maybe you're getting ready to start out. 
What are some things you're excited about? Want to hear from you? Again, come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode, make your voice heard. Hmm. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave us a rating review on iTunes or um, yeah, on iTunes, it helps us out a lot. Somebody recently, knowing that I read every review, yeah. gave us a recommendation for um, or, like organizing the podcast. Yeah. Or like they didn't recommend it. They were just like, it's not organized enough for me, but I'm an INTJ. I have very high organizational expectations. And I was like, we probably should organize a little bit better. So anyway, I do read everyone. And if you want to give us a tip like that, <laughs> leave me a five-star rating and I'll go read your tip. And maybe maybe it will encourage action. Who knows? Yeah. So leave a rating and, and, and review on iTunes. Uh, we also have a video version of this podcast on YouTube. You can look us up at Personality Hacker. You can like, subscribe, and then hit the little bell symbol that lets you know when a new episode comes out. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it at all major book retailers. And if you leave us a rating and review on Amazon or on Goodreads, that also helps us out a lot. And of course, if you are trying to determine your best fit type, Maybe this episode confused you. Maybe you're like, well, I thought I was an ENTP. Or maybe you you didn't think you were an ENTP, but one of the descriptions did fit. Head over to personalityhacker.com and take our free online assessment. It might be part of your journey in discovering your best fit type. And of course, we have a ton of fantastic resources, articles, podcasts. It's really a treasure trove. I'll call it a treasure trove of information. So head over to personalityhacker.com and, uh, and figure out your best fit type. Yeah. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. Hey, it's Joel from Personality Hacker. So a big reason people get into personality types is usually to improve their relationships with other people. And you can understand key differences between you and someone else when you understand how type works. So clearly, personality type is applied to relationships. But what about the relationship with yourself? Well, personality type can also help you navigate your career or maybe an educational path that you need to follow or other opportunities that present themselves and it helps you know which are the right choice for you. And ultimately, personality is the key to unlocking identity level worldview and life purpose. It all starts with getting the owner's manual for your personality type. In this owner's manual, we cover the basics of your personality. And then we dive a layer deeper to connect your personality to your relationships, your career, your worldview and identity. Because we believe it's your life and it should be designed for your personality. So start your owner's manual journey at personalityhacker.com. When you access your owner's manual, I recommend focusing on the ideal day exercise first, because when you start crafting your ideal day, you're being mindful about the type of lifestyle that you want. So designing a life around how you're naturally wired makes sense, and you can finally stop fighting yourself. So come discover and develop your unique personality at personalityhacker.com.